guys hear me okay? All right, good afternoon. So uh, I'm Steve Gardner with uh, House of Kush, and I will be the moderator for the panel. So uh, I'm actually very quickly going to introduce the uh, rest of my panelists and have them uh, come up on stage. I think they can hear me. So we have Ishan Kapoor with Can, Angela Pai with State House, and Arden Lee from Weed Maps. So take a seat. So we're, um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about, uh, as Laurel said, fire and smoke and the cannabis industry. And I was actually just joking that in a lot of ways it ought to be uh, surfing in a hurricane. Um, you get some good waves and there's some killer stuff, but sometimes you might get hit by a house. So um, it's a very challenging industry, but it's also uh, a pretty great industry. So very quickly, I'm actually going to start on the far side with Ishan and have him do an introduction of himself and of what CAN does. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Um, so my name is Ishan Kapoor. I'm the COO at CAN. We're, I think, the largest microdose cannabis beverage company in uh, six states and then the U.S. and Canada. Um, our focus has been creating a, a social alternative to alcohol within the cannabis space, so a little bit unique on the beverage and microdose front. Um, and it's been certainly a wild journey over the last uh, three and a half years of, as we built the brand, starting in California and then, you know, outside of the state. I think we're over 10 million cans sold, so excited to be here. And prior to this, I spent time on, on Wall Street, and then I used to run oil field operations. So it's been an interesting path here to cannabis, but certainly a, uh, a very exciting and lively one now that we're here. All right. Angela. Hi, Angela Pye, Head of Marketing for State House. We have 14 dispensaries between Harborside, which is the very, very first dispensary in terms of legal operation in California since 2006, to Urban Leaf, which are our dispensaries down south, um, pretty much core within San Diego, and then also a house of six brands within our portfolio from Kingpin King Roll, Lao Pack, Sublime, Fuzzies, Dimebag, which is you know, a lot of brands that we're really, really familiar with. This is my third cannabis company prior to State House. I was a chief marketing officer at Canacraft and also prior to that at Popo and Barclay. So really beloved brands and proud to be very California centric. All right, Arden. Hi, uh, Arden Lee. I'm the CFO of WM Tech, or uh, what uh, most folks know as Weed Maps. Uh, we're an online marketplace. We connect licensed cannabis brands and retailers with consumers that are looking for cannabis product. Uh, we sell software subscriptions and ad solutions uh, to cannabis retailers and brands. Uh, I came on board uh, to the company in early 2019, and uh, before I turn it back over to Steve, I just wanted to say for all the veterans out there, thank you for your service. Excellent. I, I would echo that. Um, so, uh, Steve Gardner, uh, co-founder of House of Kush. Uh, so, we are a legacy genetics company, uh, meaning we have control of a, a number of uh, top quality legacy strains, and we then do uh, licensing deals, uh, and we have partners in eight different states, as well as an international uh, partnership that will have us in Israel, Australia, and Germany next year, uh, among other countries. Um, we, uh, we are a majority black-owned business, uh, so there's a whole social equity conversation that, that uh, we'll dive into, and we'll get into some of that a little bit later. Um, uh, we also uh, just recently announced our partnership with Rock the Bells and LL Cool J, uh, where we're going to be uh, generating uh, THC, CBD, and merch and apparel uh, product line for uh, everything that Rock the Bells is doing, and uh, we're very, very excited about that. Uh, got a lot of other uh, kind of cool, cool stuff here and there, and again, you'll, you'll hear about those things. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Like I, I, uh, I, I always say I smoked a little weed in high school and college and then uh, stopped and then got into this industry a couple of years ago and started up again. Got to know your products. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, for me, I also have worked a ton with professional athletes. Uh, especially NFL and NBA guys, and I've seen them use cannabis for years and years for all the right reasons, uh, for the medical uh, benefits, for the sleep and pain and stress and anxiety and all the things that we know that it really impacts. And so I've been an advocate for a very long time. And uh, so then for us to get the opportunity to get into the industry and uh, work in, in uh, all the different areas, I, I was just saying backstage that this industry allows 
all of me to be applicable in the industry um, because whether I was involved in legal or insure tech business accelerators or sports and entertainment or you know you name it um, I, you've, you've got a reason to use basically everything in this industry which is pretty great so um, with uh, the introductions done uh, I actually am going to start with uh, in many ways the most challenging question, which is, what is the current state of the industry? Uh, Ishan, we'll start with you. <laughs> um, well, it's a tricky question, I would say. I think it's been a challenging year, certainly in the cannabis space, certainly on the California side, although we're seeing some of that trickle out in a, into other markets. But I don't think it's specifically unique to the industry. I think, especially for brands, consumable products, you know, I think the, the biggest hurdle that a lot of us are facing, and someone raised their sort of my eyes to it a couple weeks ago, is we came into 2022 with very, very aggressive growth expectations off of the backs of, you know, very, very strong growth through COVID. And I think that the reality is a lot of the strong brands and strong players in the space, you know, um, I think folks on this, this panel included, have continued to grow through 2022, but relative to expectations have grown slower or, you know, um, at, a, at, a, at a quieter pace than we expected to. And so it's been an interesting year in the space where I think expectations were very, very high coming in and the reality has been quite different. I think we're seeing sort of the beginnings of a, a, a culling, if you will, of some of the, the operators, you know, whether in California or outside of the state, that are not operating professionally um, with, you know, focus on, on the, you know, classic P&L items that they need to be that are, that are starting to struggle. And so I think the next year will bring a continuation of the, the strong brands, strong license holders, strong manufacturers who will continue to grow, um, albeit not at, at clips that, you know, COVID brought. And I think we're going to see consolidation. We're already seeing consolidation in the retail landscape, in the manufacturing landscape. And so I think cannabis right now is going through a little bit of a, you know, the, the strong will survive and the weak will not. Um, which, which, you know, probably needed to happen in, in the space. I think it's been certainly caught, caught us a little bit by surprise, but, you know, we've been able to focus on, on our strengths as a brand, and I think the, the brands, the, the license holders, the partners that, that do that have, have found success. I think the last thing sort of I'll, I'll say, and then I'll, I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts, is, you know, someone was asking me why it's been so rough this year, and I was out to dinner last night, and I'm spending money at bars and restaurants, and you still can't consume purchase cannabis products at bars and restaurants. So discretionary spend has started to shift back into the traditional channels. And then if I think about my work-life balance when I was working at home during COVID, maybe you have your first you know, drink at, at five in the evening instead of seven or eight. And so we've, we've lost four or five hours of consumption time with our consumers every day. And so that's why I don't think the sort of growth pressure is unique to cannabis. It, it, it's applicable to a lot of consumable products, both in and out of the space, but there's been a lot of bad behavior in the cannabis space over the past five, six years that I think we're starting to see get cleaned up a little bit. Yeah. Um, Angela, uh, from the perspective of uh, a bunch of dispensaries and a vertically integrated operator, uh, what do you see as the state of the industry? I would say all the above in terms of what you pointed out, absolutely true in terms of what I've been seeing as well. Um, and in addition to that, I think it's important to recognize no matter whether you're a small or a large operator, we're all suffering right now. We're all going through a really, really challenging time. So um, I noticed that at the start of 2022, there was very little planning that went into the early part of this year. And then somehow people kind of woke up around March and said, oh yeah, we kind of should have had a 2022 budget and a 2022 growth plan. So um, 420s around the corner, we better figure that out. So I think there was a, like a lack of planning that went out of Q4 into Q1. And then now a lot of companies have just spent the good chunk of the year just trying to catch up. There was a considerable amount of consolidation that was happening in third and fourth quarter of last year. And if you think about large companies, including us, that had to go through a few quarters of just bringing together four, two, four, three companies together just to have one seamless system of looking at what does the balance sheet look like? What staff do you need and what do you need to shed in terms of your operation to get to efficiency? And that's going to take a lot of cycles even before you think about are we hitting our growth goals? Are we investing in the right areas? So I think you know, for larger companies, it's about how do we want run more efficiently and making smart cho choices so that you're not cutting too deep. And then for smaller companies, 
looking at where they're investing and continuing to grow with new expectations. This is definitely a brand new world. <laughs> yeah, very much so. Um, but I, I certainly think that another part of, all, of the challenges are, are, this was kind of, it was the green rush. So everybody was like, oh man, we got to get into cannabis. So everybody in the pool, and you did that, and, and I know this is going to be a controversial statement, but the government didn't really plan that out very well um, and figure out what would be a good and efficient and effective system. Um, like it, and I'm not even talking about the social equity side or any of that. I'm just saying, like, tactically, how do we roll out a licensing program that's effective and efficient and doesn't flood the market with a massive amount of product? Well, which even we've seen even before going into product availability and product supply, you're thinking about the debt burden that mm -hmm. companies have, you yeah. know, have built up over time in order to be competitive, and then you got the tax burden on top of that, and have we collectively as an industry come together to grow your total addressable market? And I would say not so much. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to sell more to the same people, and as yeah. a community, we really should be broadening and looking at how we can create a larger cannabis lifestyle so that yeah. we are bringing new customers rather than just feeding on those that we have, and, and I think Headset at the end of 2021 had shown that the industry really grew because existing consumers were purchasing more rather than us growing the mm -hmm. industry with new consumers coming in. So as an industry, we need to be do, doing a much better job with that if we really want to win. Yeah, yeah. Um, Arden, how, how do you look at it? Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting because we've held this view for several quarters now that a lot of the industry struggles, and I want to kind of um, put a finer point on what we mean by industry. Um, I'm talking about the license industry, is not necessarily consumer demand issues, but more what you just hinted at, Steve, which is uh, the way licensing has rolled out and the challenges in terms of consumers being able to access high quality at value uh, in a convenient manner and that speaks to density, right? Uh, based on the data that we track, it feels still like a lot of the issues plaguing the license industry is a function of um, issues on the supply side with retailers and brands as opposed to on the demand side with consumers. We think a lot of that consumer demand um, and trade down effect is more a function of kind of license versus non-licensed market dynamics. And I think it's important, I know the question was about, you know what's the current state of the industry, but taking a step back, uh, you know, the industry in and of itself, um, despite like what's happening right now, right now, hasn't changed in terms of it's still a, depending on which data source you read, 60 to 80 to 100 billion dollar total industry within the US, but only 25 billion of that sits in licensed channels. And therein lies the dilemma. We have to figure out how to shift some of that demand that's off licensed channels back into the licensed market. Yeah. So that actually brings up a, a really interesting piece to this because for me, uh, like we, we talk all the time in the industry about changing the narrative and how can we effectively do that. So uh, the way I kind of generically break it down is you've got sort of what I would call drug culture, uh, which is, hey, everybody, let's just get high and have fun and all of that sort of thing. And then you've got the medical side. And so I think that where we're at today as an industry, we overemphasize the, the drug culture element of it, um, and we downplay the medical benefit side. Now, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. One, we don't have all the research that we'd like to have to really very clearly define exactly what the medical benefits are and how it impacts everybody differently, depending on your metabolism and your endocannabinoid system, et cetera. Um, but the, as long as we allow the drug culture uh, uh, side of it to kind of drive the bus, um, we're going to have a difficult time getting more consumers to accept it and say, oh yeah, you know, that's what I want to be a part of. I, I want to go try these products because if all they see is, you know, sort of Pineapple Express and dude, um, <laughs> we're going to have problems. And so I, I think that all of us within the industry, we, we have an obligation and a responsibility to make sure that we are talking about changing the narrative because I, this... We're in the Wild West, as we say all the time, and, and this thing is crazy and insane, but the things that we do today are going to create the industry of 10 years from now. And yeah. so what direction are we taking the industry? I mean, you know, I can fast forward, and I, I want to get this uh, uh, 
question uh, answered by you guys. If I can fast forward 10 years and say, look, we're probably going to walk into you know, Target and Walmart and we're going to have all kinds of different endocannabinoid and specific effect related uh, medicines um, that will be uh, uh, cannabis uh, der uh, derived. And we'll be able to say, oh, well, hey, when I'm having a tough time sleeping, I'm going to take that. And when I'm dealing with a lot of stress, I'll take that. And it may be different form factors. And, you know, and, and socially, we could be looking at much more uh, uh, beverage uh, uh, intake. And so I, I think that whatever we want this industry to be 10 years from now, like we're creating it now. And so we have to be careful about what steps were taken. But I, and I, I kind of want to throw that back at you. So where do you see the industry going longer term and also short term to a conversation we had yesterday? Um, even six months from now, nine months from now, what, what does the back half of 2023 look like? So let's go big picture and then take it down. So Arden, how about big picture? Uh, yep. Where are you seeing things go in 10 years from now? Yeah, that's a great question. So I might start with some current state kind of realities about the industry today. Uh, I should probably address these in your last question because I think that's important to understanding what does this industry look like 10 years from now. So currently, if you look at all licensed states, there's the equivalent of about one licensed retailer for every 25 to 30,000 residents. And I just want to start there, right? When you think about cannabis as a consumer good or as a medicinal product, well, a lot of folks like to compare cannabis, obviously, to alcohol or uh, pharmaceuticals or the like. Well, listen, um, there's an alcohol retailer for every three to 5,000 residents. There's a pharmacy for every two to 3,000 residents. And so to answer your question, um, 10 years from now, we would expect that there's anywhere from four to eight X, the number of retailers, licensed retailers that are distributing cannabis product uh, uh, as states continue to densify and issue licenses. Uh, now that's on the supply side, on the demand side today, uh, cannabis users that are active cannabis users, and I, what I mean by that is folks that are consuming at least monthly, not the folks that are eating the edible around Thanksgiving or the holidays or what have you, um, that's only about 12 to 13 percent of the population today, right? Um, you look at alcohol usage, clearly multiples higher. You look up at can, uh, active cannabis usage uh, up in Canada, where it's federally regulated, that number is 20 percent plus, right? And so you would expect to Angela's point earlier that mainstream perceptions would change, you would get more um, activist, active cannabis users uh, in terms of um, you know, penetration rates uh, within the industry. I think the, 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 uh, the question though is what does the landscape look like to your point around, is it consolidated uh, with a handful of retailers that are carrying cannabis product? Uh, do you find cannabis product on the shelves of every general merchandiser out there? And therein lies um, some of the crystal ball debates that folks have mm -hmm. around the path of regulation, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, so. totally. Angela, how about you? <laughs> There's so many things to yeah, dive in on there. <laughs> um, going back to stats, because I'm really data-driven. So if you look at the alcohol industry, which has had several decades, what, 60, 70, uh, 60, 70 years of brand building in terms of overall brand recognition, you know, if you look at maybe the early days of absolute vodka to where we are today in, in terms of the familiarity of brands with alcohol and how right now in the early days of us being in the cannabis industry in terms of brand recognition, brand loyalty, it's just not there yet. You know, we're not anywhere near that maturity um, as an industry. And we're looking at one out of four dollars being spent in cannabis in a licensed facility versus that three out of four dollars in an unlicensed facility. Plus a demand that's not really increasing, but have an oversupply. So if we look at where we are today and we, where we want to get to in 10 years time, I think there are a lot of, of wishes that we would like to have. We would wish for a larger portion of a legal industry that is operating and is healthy. We would like to see that wellness, which is 8% of the industry, grow to a much larger percentage. We're, we're, we know that every day 10,000 people in America turn 60 which means that we have an aging demographic and cannabis is certainly a healthier alternative to most pharmaceutical products and even to, you know, especially to alcohol. So how can we really look at cannabis as a therapeutic solution in addition to the enjoyment part of, you know, what you spoke of just now? Because cannabis can be 
really helpful in terms of you getting a better night's sleep, enjoying time with your friends, and just winding down for the day. And I think Can has done an amazing job in terms of looking at how to create that narrative of enjoying social time um, in, in a healthier way. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I think, Steve, to, to kind of throw it back to what you, you structured, which is you have sort of a pillar of drug culture and then you have a pillar of sort of, you know, a medicinal use. I think from, from my perspective, there's a third pillar, which is the customers that aren't in the cannabis channel right now that, that you know, speaking from our, from our experience is what we're really targeting that I think is the growth in demand that we're going to see because I think that, that sort of, you know, those, the competing in the, in the drug culture umbrella is competing for that addressable market that's about $100 billion and getting, you know, instead of three out of every $4 that are being spent on the illicit market, getting 50% of that back, right? Mm -hmm. But there's an untapped opportunity, which is all of the people who are kind of curious or interested in cannabis who we want to bring into the space. And I think it's been really interesting as, as you know, we've expanded eastward where new markets have opened up and there have been dosing restrictions like you see in Massachusetts. Um, and, and there's been a lot of appetite for customers to come into the channel. And the analogy I like to use is, you know, it's like you go, you go try something once for the first time. And if you have a bad experience, yep. if you buy a 100 milligram chocolate bar and who eats one square of a chocolate bar, right? Like you're never coming back. Yeah. And we've lost that customer to alcohol, to alcohol alternatives, to whatever other things they're consuming on a daily basis, um, you know, for, for good. It's really expensive to go get them back. And I think that's why you've seen, you know, a lot of growth in microdose beverage and microdose products on the East Coast relative to the West Coast because we've lost that opportunity a little bit here on the West Coast. And so I think what's happening in the hemp space in states like Minnesota is that third pillar, which is really interesting. And I don't know long term if that's, you know, farm bill derivatives or if it comes from the license market, but I think there is a, a very large opportunity on the, like, microdose side, right, where it's not being treated like a pharmaceutical product, it's not being beer and wine and craft cocktails aren't being manufactured at pharma grade because it's too expensive to sell a $2 cocktail when you're keeping it to pharma grade, right? And you're not preaching a medicinal benefit to it. And then on the flip side, you know, the, the infrastructure and the licensing and the risk for states and tax bases on heavy duty sort of flower vapes, um, anything with a high potency, there is a different risk profile. And so I think we see sort of three pillars, one which is very much pharmaceutical, and I think rescheduling probably helps with the, res uh, the research on that front. I think we see the existing market, which is kind of set up to some degree to cater to capturing more of that, you know, heavy drug culture environment. And then I think, and, and this is where, you know, I have what I want to see in 10 years, of course, but there's that third pillar, which is, look, these are products that you buy at a grocery store and you expand the points of distribution very quickly, mm -hmm. you lower barrier to entry, you lower the risk, and I think classifying sort of cannabis in those three pillars is really where we see the industry going, and there'll be opportunity along all three, but if we stay in the channel of just converting those users who are on the illicit market to the illicit market, it's gonna be an uphill battle, mm -hmm. because the, you know, from, regulatory, from the regulatory landscape to the tax burden, it's always gonna be yeah. more expensive. Yeah. And, and some percent of people are not ever going to leave the black market. That's where they're going to remain, and that's exactly. part of the deal. So, uh, Insel, you brought up one thing uh, that I, I always feel compelled to share this, and, and this, uh, this idea is something that I have stolen, and unfortunately I don't recall who, who said it to me first, but it's an analogy. So uh, we, one of the trends that we have seen uh, recently with, within uh, the consumer base is that people go into uh, dispensaries and say, hey, what's the highest THC you got? Like, I, I want high THC, high THC, and, and so a lot of people are talking about that kind of thing. And so here's the analogy that I stole. <clears throat> so um, you don't choose your dessert based on which has the most sugar. <laughs> Why are you choosing your cannabis based on which has the most THC? Because the reality is these products have terpene profiles and flavors and how does it smoke? And there, there's all these other elements that we're uh, kind of ignoring and just saying, oh, well, just give me the highest possible THC when in reality there's plenty of strains uh, that are much lower THC but, are, but give you a much better uh, overall entourage effect and everything else. So, um, so I, that, that's one thing I just, I always feel compelled to point out because it drives me a little bit nuts <laughs> that everybody's so focused on high THC. And, and that, will, that will, I think, change. It's starting to a little bit. Um, we're starting to get bud tenders trained and we're starting to get people more up to speed on, on the, the, everything else about the plant. 
Anyways, like I said, that, that's a little personal mission of mine. I always like to share that. It's an education challenge. And For we sure. as yeah. the industry have almost trained people yeah. to behave in that way. And part yep. of it is the fact that you have to put the tack on everything. Per, right. per the government, but part of it is, you know, people are, are not being well educated about the plant and then they're yeah. looking for dollar value, you know, per milligram. And, and so we've almost forced the customer into that mm -hmm. environment. It's really interesting because you look at states like Nevada where you're required to put the, the top four terpenes on mm -hmm. the packaging and people go terpene shopping, right? Yeah. So it's, it's an information um, yeah. awareness thing that is a function of, of the regulatory landscape. And I think what shifts, shifts us away from sort of chasing tack is brands. Yeah. Yep. Because to, to your point earlier, if you have a loyalty to a brand, you know, you're not even looking at what the nope. test results are. You're like, I love Wonder Bread, yep. and I'm just going to buy Wonder Bread no matter what it is or, you yeah. know, whatever the brand might be. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's, that's perfect. Um, so, uh, of course, one of the big things hanging over the industry right now that everybody's trying to figure out is federal legalization. So, A, when's it going to happen? <laughs> And, and B, and, and more importantly, because the when, I think, is a very tricky question, um, when it, whenever it happens, because it will, it's, it could be a long ways down the road, but whenever it happens, what impact is that going to have on the industry, and, and what really is it going to allow us to do, you know, beyond just interstate commerce and, you know, some <laughs> basic things like that. So, Arden, let me start with you. Federal legalization, what, yeah. is, what is Weedmap's perspective on when that might happen? Well, you know, it's it's clearly a when question. Um, I'd say it, and it's it's also clearly hard to predict. Uh, uh, we're hopeful that it's a near-term type event, um, not within the next 12, 18 months, but within the next few years. Um, certainly, kind of within the next decade, because I know you asked an earlier question: ten years from now, what what the industry looks like, um, what changes as a result? You know, going back to um, how I was framing things in terms of. Uh, the supply side and demand side, uh, hopefully when that happens, mainstream perceptions around cannabis um, change and evolve, right? And going to the earlier stat of what active cannabis usage looks like today here in our country versus another country where it's federally regulated, again, you can see that there's a lot of kind of room uh, for uh, increased penetration just from mainstream perceptions of, yeah, this is a federally regulated product. Um, I think on the consumer side as well, hopefully you would expect uh, when federal regulation happens, and maybe it takes some time post-federal re regulation because there's always a lag effect once uh, regulations are introduced to when uh, you know, businesses are operational and, and consumers have access to product. But you would also expect that um, some of the pain points that consumers have would change, meaning uh, they're uh, currently uh, it's really hard to access cannabis in a convenient manner, uh, whether it's because of drive times for delivery operators or drive times to get to store. Hopefully that changes, right? Um, I'd say also, uh, hopefully uh, we're in a better spot as it relates to surfacing product information uh, to consumers. Because at the end of the day, as we've all been talking about, cannabis is a very complex product. It's not just a consumer good. It's a pharmaceutical product. It has a lot of effects. And a lot of consumers, the barrier to entry is just understanding the complexity of the product when there are so many form factor SKUs and so on and so forth, right? I think as it relates to businesses, um, you would expect that there's more opportunity to expand with continued issuance and licenses. Hopefully, um, some easing of restrictions around ability to access capital. Access to capital is a massive, massive, massive pain point for everyone within the industry. And if we can remove that barrier, that uh, you know, takes off some of the shackles um, that are right now uh, chaining some of the, the, the businesses from being able to grow effectively, right? Uh, and then I guess I'd also say um, uh, on the margin, you know, with uh, things like 280E for folks that aren't familiar, uh, you know, plant touching businesses can't deduct operating expenses for federal tax purposes. And that in and of itself is a structural uh, barrier in their ability to invest for growth. So uh, long-winded way of saying, um, hopefully you see better access to cannabis in terms of um, ability to shop, ability to get information that's necessary to inform product decisions. And then on the supply side, on the business side, better access to all the things that businesses need to grow. Uh, capital and uh, the ability to kind of invest that capital to uh, acquire users and grow their brands and, and the like. Yeah. 
obviously Safe Banking Act, and that that is such a big part of the access to capital that we're really struggling with. For but sure. We won't dive into that right now because yeah. that's a whole other uh, <laughs> tangled ball of wax. Um, Angela, how about you? We certainly want Safe Banking Act sooner rather than later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of federal legalization, there are pros and cons to that, right? You know, the um, the good aspect of it in terms of the pros, access to capital, right? Um, unlocking all of the marketing channels that we don't have access to today. We're just like working around as much as we can. Um, we can't do social, you know, social ads and, and um, a lot of the tools that are not available to us because it's not federally legal. And then the, the downside of it is um, in whatever it's gonna be two years, three years, five years from now, do we as cannabis operators have all our ducks in a row that we're ready to compete when the pharmaceutical, the tobacco, and the alcohol industry comes in and says, okay, we've been gearing up for this for years and now we're ready to go. Um, do we have the right operating team, the discipline, and have the, the infrastructure to be able to compete because we certainly don't have the deep pockets. So I think there's, you know, there's pros and cons to it both. Uh, if I was to bet, I would say four to five years. Yeah. Ishan, how about you? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a really interesting point on do we have our ducks in a row and back to your, one of your questions that I've now not answered any of, the, the near term, I think, you know, what we're seeing is a focus on gross profit dollars and folks getting their ducks in a row. Now, if that's enough or not remains to be seen, yep. but, but absolutely we're starting to see, you know, a focus on business fundamentals in a way that I don't think we've ever seen in the space before. Um, as for sort of federal regulatory change, and my guess is as good as sort of anyone's here. Um, I, I expect, uh, you know, some sort of regulatory shift, you know, in the 2024 election cycle, whether it's, you know, minor or major, um, remains to be seen. I think we're going to start to see more states follow, what, you know, what Minnesota has done with, you know, allowing five milligram or under products derived from hemp, in intoxicating or not. There's 26 states that are allowing that, and there's a booming sort of gray area market that is playing in that space. But I think regardless of when sort of wide scale, you know, legalization happens, there's also going to be several years of states trying to understand what commerce has to look like because the reality is California is the ag belt for the U.S. by and large, and cannabis will continue to be grown at the best economics in the state of California with a couple other states as well. And so there are large tax bases from Illinois, Nevada, Ohio, Oklahoma that the states are going to be really interested in protecting where they can't compete on a sort of cost to grow perspective. And so I, I have a, a my, my worry is that we see a legalization headline and then we're still five plus years away from actual true interstate commerce um, mm -hmm. because folks are, are really protective of, of tax bases that have grown over the past five to ten years. Um, but, but my view is, is really we're going to see waves and first we'll be safe banking, yep. maybe rescheduling, yep. and then you know, ultimately we'll see some wide scale regulatory shifts. But at that point, I think you know, we'll know if we have our ducks in a row <laughs> or not because I think market entrance will will dive in before full legalization. Yeah, and I think you're already seeing that, right, in terms of the casualties of poor practices, but lots of great ideas not well implemented. Mm -hmm. And that's coming, uh, we've seen that in the last 12 months, where not just the cannabis industry, but all industries are hitting major headwinds. So that's really going to separate those with really strong plans and discipline versus those who just have great ideas. Yeah, it's, um, it's a massive question that nobody has an, an answer for. And, and to your point, Angela, it is very much of a pros and cons uh, thing. Like, I, there, there's a big part of me that doesn't even want it to go federally legal, which, by the way, if Biden said tomorrow we are making it federally legal, <laughs> it doesn't mean that every state is going to open its doors the day after. Like, it's a very long road from the time he says yes. So there, there's... There, there's, there's a path that you got to go through on all of that. Um, and it is one of those things that is kind of, it's a linchpin in certain areas and it's a hindrance in other areas. So it, it's, it's going to be fascinating to continue to watch where it goes and, you know, whether this one little uh, deal that Biden did, to, uh, uh, you know, get people out of prison in D.C., which was a, a nominal move at best, by the way. Um, I mean, it was something, so I'll, I'll, give him, <laughs> I'll give him points for that, but it was nominal at best. Um, 
there's, there's just, we're gonna see a lot more challenges uh, and, it's, and it's gonna require all operators and obviously the four of us, we're in, we're in this industry in different ways, in different uh, uh, parts of it. Um, it's gonna require all operators to be very flexible <laughs> and to be capable of pivoting and trying new things on a pretty regular basis, which by the way is one of the cool things about this industry. Um, you do get those opportunities quite often. <laughs> um, so, uh, so actually, we, we've kind of talked about a fair number of the challenges and the issues that, that we've all got, and we all know they're out there. Um, let's kind of look at the other side. Like, what, what are the real opportunities that we have in this industry, and you know, where can we, where can we ultimately take this? And, and, and like, I'll start. So, the, of course, the beginning of that, uh, the, my earlier conversation is, you know, 10 years from now, whatever the industry is going to be is going to be based on things and choices that we make today. So if we're making good choices that have long-term foundational impacts, then we're gonna be in a much better place than, than if we're not. I, I do think, and again, as a majority black-owned business for us, and as we look at the social equity side of things, um, I do think that there are, uh, there's an amazing opportunity for this industry to kind of, I won't say right the wrongs of uh, past drug policy, but to have a really, really powerful impact on communities of color and poor communities. Um, that have obviously been absolutely devastated by the war on drugs. Um, we can literally stand up and create jobs in communities and create opportunities for those people who've been uh, hit so hard um, to actually benefit economically. Uh, I, I don't know the numbers on this. I've checked around with a couple of economists. Uh, you know, it, we've all heard like the wealth gap, you know, average white family is worth about 150,000, average black family is worth about 15,000. Um, that should never be the case. And that, that is the case because of a lot of bad policy. We don't know how much of the, the war on drugs uh, added to that policy or took away from it or whatever, um, but we know that it had a pretty significant negative impact on those communities. So do we as an industry create more opportunities to, to drive wealth and to drive economic benefit into those communities. And so, like one thing that we're doing is uh, uh, we're doing a tour uh, starting next spring of a number of historically black colleges and universities. And so we're gonna go down there and, and yes, bring a number of entrepreneurs and celebrities and athletes and folks to talk about you know, the business of fashion and, and the business of sports and entertainment and, and social justice and some other things. Um, but we're also gonna stand up uh, business accelerators on each campus so that we're gonna go to the kids and say, hey, uh, give us business ideas that you can implement in your communities that will create jobs. And these don't need to be uh, cannabis industry at all. So the more we can start creating and, uh, jobs in those communities as we get people out of prison, which hopefully that's the first part of the federal legalization that gets addressed is that we get, get people out and expunge their records. But as we get them out of prison, the big issue is are there jobs in the community or not? So I, I do look at like, yes, we've got tons of challenges and tons of issues and all that sort of thing, but we do have an opportunity as an industry to dramatically change the long-term economic benefit of these communities that have been hurt so hard uh, by, by the war on drugs. So that's just one. I know there's a lot of other opportunities for it. Uh, Arden, how about you? No, I echo everything that you just said. I mean, in, in one of the big opportunities clearly is um, job creation, right? Cannabis has the potential to create one of the next big booming industries within the US. And we've only scratched the surface of that. We're still mm -hmm. in like the first inning of that, right? And you think about all the ancillary impacts in terms of job creation, um, other infrastructure that, that, uh, that, that occurs around establishing a more kind of um, functioning uh, licensed industry within the US. Uh, you know, our policy team has done research in the past uh, that shows that when you have more density of licensed uh, 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 access to product, things like crime incidence rates go down, opioid usage rates go down, real estate prices uh, actually go up, and so on and so forth. And so I think um, as you see a maturing of or continued kind of growth of um, the license industry within the US, you'll see that kind of rising tide lifting all ships type impa impact, right? Um, I also think uh, to uh, what Angela and Ishan were saying earlier, there's a big opportunity uh, for brand creation, right? We're just at very early innings of shaping the consumer's perception of how they should shop and discover cannabis. Right now, 
the challenge is a lot of users, and a lot of this is a challenge because of regulation, but the challenge is a lot of users don't shop the way normal consumers would uh, within the cannabis industry, and that too will change, right? And you know, you think about the opportunity that that then creates uh, for brands uh, 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 within the industry as well, so. Perfect, Angela. Well, diving into that. Um, in, in terms of what we can do as an industry, looking at where it started, where it was, you know, barrels of flour, right, unbranded, and then we go into, you know, uh, dispensaries that might be, you know, selling bulk or, or not, not necessarily branded, and then training consumers to go from um, product marketing in terms of product functions to more of an emotional relationship with the with the brand, like, as they would with other brands that they're buying at a supermarket or, or a retail store or anything like that. That's going to take a little bit of time, and I think that's where the poor practices of, you know, potency, and you know, price per ounce or per gram, um, and you know, what's and, and buying against that level versus really looking at what are the qualities of certain brands? What does it stand for? What is its purpose? And do I align with that? Does that resonate with who I am as a person where I'm buying, say, a, a garment from Patagonia versus a fast fashion brand that don't have the same type of mission as they do? We haven't gotten to that level of maturity yet. And, and as an industry that's creating jobs I re and, and in terms of equitably building, let's try not to make cannabis like tech, you know, in terms of where technology have gone, gone in the last 20 years where we've created this very, very small percentage of those who truly benefit from that growth and, and that explosion, uh, explosion of wealth for a very few number of people. And I think as industry operators, we do have that responsibility of saying, let's not let it get to tech. Let's create something that's going to be more equitable. Let's find ways to being more choiceful in terms of how we grow. Yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, absolutely. I think... Um, you know, I, I can echo everything the three of you said, but another sort of pillar I would say that's interesting is just on the product innovation side and the R&D side that you're seeing in cannabis. And there's a story, you know, our, you know, you can't mix cannabis oil or distillate in a beverage. Oil and water don't mix. And so there's been technology developed to make oil water soluble that's been ported from outside of the, the space, but has been sort of um, perfected in, in cannabis or certainly advanced in, in cannabis. And now we're actually seeing that same technology leave the cannabis industry and return to the alcohol industry where you might use thousands of pounds of hops to create an IPA. But you can extract oil from hops, you can emulsify that hop oil, you can create an IPA without the waste, without the freight, without the sort of um, ag yield loss that you'd normally experience. And so I think one of the, the really compelling things or exciting things to me is as we think about sort of continuing to grow in the space, the product development work, the system development work, some of it a function of the regulatory landscape that we are doing as operators actually has value beyond the space that we're operating in. And to see technology, systems, processes exported out and then to layer on, well, if we can behave in a better way than mm -hmm. someone like, or an industry like tech and see that exported out, it's very exciting because I think we've always viewed ourselves as, okay, like we're, we're, we're hamstrung because of the way things have to work, but to see that we've been able to come up with creative solutions as an industry and see them leave the industry and benefit other spaces is really exciting and I think powerful and certainly something that gets me motivated on a day-to-day on -day basis. Cool, cool. Um, so, by the way, I do want to open it up if anyone has a question. So, I'm going to come to you in just a second. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, the rest of you, you can think about any questions that you may have. Um, and, and I'm going to throw something back at you guys. Uh, so, just for, uh, for grins, uh, l let's say that you are uh, voted president of cannabis and you could make one decision uh, it, to change the industry in whatever way you see fit. And I'm going to give you a second to think about that. I'm going to ask him this question. Um, but just to kind of throw that back at us, and so what, what would the one thing be that you would dive into? So, sir, you had a question. Arden, you're the CEO. Yeah, I, I can take a crack at that. So, um, 
You know, I think historically a lot of folks have thought about U.S. licensed cannabis because the historical data, and again, we're aggregating all markets. Every market is very different in terms of how they're faring right now, right now. But historically, folks have generally thought about U.S. cannabis as, let's call it a 30%-ish annual grower. Currently, this year, um, expectations are that licensed states as a whole will grow soaking wet in the low double digits, um, perhaps even lower than that. So it's a dramatic shift in terms of growth. Now, to my point about you can't look at it as a whole, you have to look at it state by state. So let's take our home state, California. California is $5 billion in terms of licensed GMV against the in licensed industry's $25 billion, right? So it's about 20% of the total U.S. cannabis um, uh, industry on the licensed side. Cannabis, uh, California end market GMV for licensed um, uh, businesses, for licensed purchase, it's been down double digits in terms of decline year over year for most of this year. Think about it like 10, low 10 to 12 percent. So you've gone from a dynamic where there was consistent growth in that kind of like double digit area that now in certain of these like very scaled markets is now double digit declines, if that makes sense. Okay. I'm going to. So hang on just a second. I'll come to your question in just a second. Ishan, I'm going to start with you. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. President of cannabis. <laughs> President of cannabis. What, what would you do? Um, man, I, I think, I don't know how, but, you know, 8x distribution footprint. <laughs> um, I, I think the fact is, to your point earlier, Arden, we're just, it's not available in enough places. There's too much friction in the space. And I think, you know, if there was a way for me to snap my fingers and have cannabis products available in eight times the amount of spaces that they are today, that would be the first thing I would do. Right. That would be good. Okay, Angela, and then I'm going to come to you. Oh, on-premise on consumption. Mm -hmm. So if you look at alcohol, uh, I think 25% of alcohol comes from on-premise consumption. So if we can rapidly get to that point where there is you know, that opportunity for 25% of consumption happening on premise, that's gonna do a lot for our business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, sir, you had a question. Yes, uh, actually I have two questions. First of all, this is an amazing panel. Thank you so much for all of us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
No, I haven't seen any just, just yet in, in, in terms of that. So real quick, I was going to come back. So uh, my, my president of cannabis thing is uh, <laughs> access to capital. We've already talked about that a little bit. That's massive with a, 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 a real and effective strategy for how to implement that. Um, entrepreneurial training attached to it so that we are actually effectively training the people that are getting the funding. Um, because as we know, a lot of people are flying into the industry blind just because they think it would be cool. And that's not a, a precursor to great success in business, typically. Um, so uh, I, I would add those two things. Arden, what, what's your president of cannabis? I had the same answer as Ishan in terms of just increasing um, access, meaning just un removing caps on licenses, removing uh, uh, prohibitions at the county level against, um, or city level against uh, licensed retailers and the like. And if I had the ability to have a number two choice, it would be access to capital. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we would all agree that the access to capital is a, a big thing. <laughs> like as someone who's in the middle of a raise right now, access to capital is, it's tricky. Um, and as I know, we've all been involved in different elements of uh, raising capital and it's, it's, a, it's a rough game at times. Um, so we're, we're actually at the end of our time. Um, so first of all, I want to thank my fellow panelists. Really appreciate you guys' efforts. So Thanks, Steve. Well done. Um, and, uh, and second of all, I mean, we'll, we'll be around for a little bit, so uh, happy to connect with any of you guys that are interested. Um, Look, cannabis is it's a fascinating industry. Uh, it's got a lot of potholes in it, and uh, it's got enormous opportunities uh, going forward. And I think that as long as we continue to remain focused on the benefits that the plant does provide uh, and provide great service and educate the heck out of the consumers, I think we've got a very bright future. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for uh, participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.